Dick and Dr. Anil Patil. And it's a proud privilege for the Arthroscopy Study Group to have you on our webinar. It's, it's my pleasure as well. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the research and the great accumulation that you have for your work on the elbow. And my understanding is all pain on the lateral side of the elbow is not tennis elbow. Oh, yes. And I'm going to hear from the master to you know demystify the myth of uh, tennis elbow. Okay, over to you, doctor, and kindly proceed with your presentations. Okay. Now, Roshan, shall we start? Yes, yes, we can start now. They're live okay. on YouTube. So, yes, thank you. Mute all the participants and then we yes, can go. Yes, yes, I will do that. I will do that. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. Yes, yes. Can you share my screen? Okay. No, we can't see Mehmet. We, we, can't we see can you. see now. I can see yeah, now. Now, now, now we can see. Okay, you can proceed Mehmet. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you yeah, hear okay. me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Your screen has been shared. We can okay. see your screen, so you can proceed. I'll just mute everyone and you can okay. proceed. These yes, you can proceed. Pictures. Okay. This is my university, Ankara University, where I spent 35 years of my life, my residency and my academic life. Then I am retired because of the legal issues. So I'm working in a private hospital at the moment and private office. So, but still my connections with the university is continuing. They are like my brothers. Well, I have established a team of uh, hand surgery and uh, upper limb surgery because my hand surgery fellowship was in Japan in 1988 and 90. I had hand surgery and microsurgery education in Japan, in Okinawa from Kunio Ibaraki. Then in 1994, I went to the United States to learn wrist arthroscopy, but when I was there, the group moved from Baylor College and their shoulder guy was Gary Garsman. So Garsman needed a guy to scrub with him. So in 1994, I started scrubbing with Gary Garsman in shoulder arthroscopy. So that changed my life. I was a hand surgeon, plus I was in shoulder arthroscopy in 1994 and 95. Then when I go back to my country, I started shoulder as well. Since then, the newcomers have the chance of having shoulder, elbow, and uh, hand surgery at the same time. So our department became uh, upper extremity department. So these are, so I'm trying to, these are my disclosures. I'm, uh, I have a design which is manufactured by a German company. It's an external fixator and the new concept of distal radius plate. But I also, uh, teach for the Depuy Cement Microsurgical AO Pfizer and Novartis. And I was uh, the past president of Turkish Shoulder and Elbow Society. I was the vice president of Turkish Hand Society when Professor Ege was in charge. So I was the secretary for eight years. So I'm where I take the uh, techno parks and societies, but I'm mostly involved in upper extremity society. On the sports side, I am a member of European Medical Committee, member of the European Volleyball Federation. But in my country, I'm the member of Health Committee of Soccer, Volleyball, and Tennis Federation. And I also have some sportsmen that I have operated their shoulders. They have the one uh, weightlifters and some wrestlers. After rotator cuff surgery, they had the world championship. They are my, they are my prouds. And we, if we refer back to uh, tennis elbow, this is one of the signs of the oldest amphitheater in Turkey left from Likians. It was one of the uh, face expressions, many statues that it was the theaters, but they were the face expressions. So the history of uh, tennis elbow goes to 1982. This is the first uh, described letter in the atlas. It was the term called Long tennis elbow, which is attributed also in 1983 in the British Medical Journal. So it was first published in uh, Lancet, then it's in the British Medical Journal. 
And also it's uh, 1929, the etiology of tennis elbow is various, but the pathology is obscure and obscure is uncertain, said. So this is the first paper that I can found in Syriacs in 1932. It's the tennis elbow, which describes the pain on the lateral side of the arm. Uh, the pain increases with the wrist extension and the elbow flexion. So this is the first original papers which been described. So the epidemiology is, is mostly in the fourth and fifth decade. And the lateral side is uh, more uh, seven times frequent than men's than the uh, lateral side is seven times frequenter than the medial side. And 70% it is on the dominant extremity. And still we don't know the pathology. This is the video of Yang Nimun. He's a good friend of mine from South Korea. He was a past president of Korean Soldier and Elbow Society. In YouTube, you can see a lot of animations of him about uh, tennis elbow, the examination, and the presentation of the diseases. The symptoms is mostly with resisted wrist extension. So without moving the elbow, if you resist in the wrist extension, and also with gripping activities, and it also, because of the pain, it decreases the grip strength. And this is uh, Dr. Nils is one of the papers, one of the most common papers have been read and written person is a Nils. So he is the guy who is going to describe the pathology. He says that the degenerative overuse of the extensor carpus brevis of the common extensor tendon, aside from the degenerative changes, the histological findings, there is a granulation tissue, there is micro ruptures, Abundance of fibroblasts, vascular hyperplasia, unstructured collagen. And everybody says that we call that it's an inflammation, but they don't find any inflammatory cells like macrophages, lymphocytes, and neutrophils within the tissue. So also ultrasound evaluation after calcifications or intrasubstance tears, uh, there's a marked irregularity of the lateral epicondyle and thickening and heterogeneity of the common extensor tendon. So this is the only histological picture. I searched around, you know, the Google and YouTube. This is the only couple of pictures that's giving us the signs of tendocytes, and this is the normal tendon. So it is called as, these changes are named as angiofibroblastic hypogonesis. It's a fibroblast invasion, a few inflammatory cells, but there is higher in the degeneration and vascular proliferation. So, in general, the histology says that fibroblast hypertrophy, disorganized collagen. So there is collagen, but the organization of collagen is disorganized and vascular hyperplasia. And this is controversial with, uh, if you read and if you listen to other people, they say that the reason of uh, this degeneration may be due to uh, nutritional deficiency or vascular deficiency, but the Pathology says that there is vascular hyperplasia uh, because that's why we still don't know much about the disease. I will tell you in the next coming minutes about the treatment. Some of the treatment, uh, the ration is increasing the vascularity and the vascular circulation over there. But the histological study says that there is a high vascular hyperplasia. So it means that there is increase in the vascularity, but it doesn't help about the nutrition. And the diagnosis primarily based on the symptoms and the uh, exam. So as the title has changed that the histopathology, so I searched about the, I tried to read more papers about histopathology. There are more or less, say, tries to explain the same thing, but uh, they all say that multiple studies reporting the histologic appearance of ECRB specimens characterized in the combination of following characters. Abundant fibroblasts, collagen disorganization, vascular, and lack of inflammatory cells. Also in biomechanical analysis, they showed that the extensive concentration of constriction of the extensor carpus brevis is due to, especially backhand tennis players, uh, there is repetitive microtrauma may result in the tears of origin of the tendon. So this is acceptable because if you have continuous repetitive microtrauma, then the origin or the tendon might have 
a continuous uh, strain may uh, due to that strain there may be the micro tears all the implies that inflammation is not only the present at the early stages but the term tendinosis which is defined by vascular hyperplasia and active fibroblasts now if i we listened uh, dr mafuli two days ago i couldn't follow his slides but i have listened to them. in tendinosis you have micro ruptures in the tendon especially in achilles we have an elongation and swelling of the tendon because inside we have uh, we have some scar tissue formation but for for the lateral epicondylitis it is different because we have also granulation tissue we have the same disorganized collagen but it is not in the tendon it's more like at the antesis side of the tendon it's, it's the bone side so probably the character is different because achilles and the uh, uh, extensor carpalidalis spray's origin may not be compared equally but long tendons have different sort of tendinitis, but this is the enterosopathies have granulation tissue at the origin of the tendon. So <clears throat> there are also other uh, authors like Goldie, Conrad, and Hooper. They have the microscopic association of the findings, especially tearing. Subsequently, the increased rates of apoptosis and cellular autography have been observed in tenocytes resulting in disruption of extracellular collagen matrix and weakening of the tendon. So this is the mechanism. This is still unsolved. So they have the tenocytes and you don't know how do they uh, result effect the collagen, this uh, collagen, extracellular collagen disorganization. So we don't know the mediator of the tenocyte to uh, collagen formation. So also, uh, they examine this is an anatomical picture. This picture shows us uh, the brief of this because this is the extensor carpalidus brevis. Most of the pathologies underneath this done, but we have uh, extensor digitorum communis and also extensor carpalidus longus. Why extensor carpalidus brevis, not the other tendons? So probably they all share more or less the same, but probably then we can conclude that the main uh, reason is that wrist extension is the main cause of this uh, overload. So this is the torn tendon because it starts here. And also we can see the, we can see the radial nerve. Radial nerve, you know that it comes and there is the posterior intrusive branch. This branch goes over the radial head. So in the diagnostic uh, procedures, especially in the differential diagnosis, we have a nerve entrapment, which is mostly one of the most uh, misdiagnosis in this title, because most of the resistant cases underneath, they have the nerve entrapment. Uh, degenerative then these changes, the origin is extensor carpalidus brevis. The characteristic appearance of this tissue consists of invasion of immature fibroblasts and disorganized. So it is done uh, in under electron microscopy. And electron microscopy has demonstrated that these vascular buds do not possess a lumen. So there is vascularity, you can see the blood elements, but you don't have the uh, lumen uh, vessels. This granulation-like tissue has been termed like angiofibroblastic hyperplasia. So this has been defined by Nish, and it's called as tendinitis, but it is actually a fibroblastic hyperplasia. This is intrinsically abnormal, and itself is true then adjacent normally appearing of fibrous therapy, disrupting them. So you cannot see the uh, gross macro, macrologic differences in the tendon. You can notice some granulation tissue, but hypercellularity and microfragmentation, and if it's the severe, then you cannot in the surgery, because we go surgery for the cases who are resistant to uh, conservative treatment. Maybe in the early stages, if you go for surgery, you will not see any difference then from the other tendons. 
The pain, the origin of the pain, as we said, this, this is the lateral side. Uh, the main reason pain is called, which is papered in the Uchio's papers, uh, after immunohistochemistry and antibody said, substance P and calcitonin gene related peptide is the real cause of pain, not the inflammatory cells. So inflammatory cells are not the real cause of pain. The cause of pain is substance P and calcitonin gene related things. And current theories of delayed or failed repair match with this because moral find uh, found to be a go phase in the uh, T lymphocytes in the go phase. And these have the failure of signal to replicate an undifferentiated heal macro tear seen in other traumatic conditions. So the pathology of the tendinopathies and the tendinosis, the literature of uh, I told you before this Achilles tendon, patellar tendon, is rabbit. Three most commonly seen tendinopathies, but the characteristics of the patellar and Achilles tendon is different than ECRB because their tendinous side is much more short than ECRB. So the terminology there is a confliction because uh, Achilles and patellar tendon they are elongated. They have a lot of strain on them, but ECRB is an entosopathy. It, there is a little, very little amount of tendon which changes the longitudinal size. And the findings include that tenosate hyperplasia. So in this paper, you can see, this is the first paper that I see tenosite hyperplasia because in the other papers, we have fibroblasts, not the tenocytes. Endothelial cell hyperplasia and microvascular thrombosis. So this is going to be a hyaline degeneration. This is the definition of hyaline degeneration. It may be fatty mucoid calcified or fibromuscle activity. So we found one more histopathologic characteristic that that is the hyaline degeneration. And norocomous uh, chemicals, significant levels of substance P and calcium gene related peptides. Afterwards in other papers as well. See, the two main causes of pain of substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptide and also found in this tantrum. So why doesn't it heal? And Schneeberger had a paper in 2002. Schneeberger is a good friend of mine from Switzerland. He's working with Christian Gerber and he was trained with Christian Gerber, still working in uh, Switzerland. He says that the blood supply near the avascular proximal tendon on the surface. So in the previous papers, we see that there is an increased vascularity uh, in the lesion side, but he says that blood supply near the avascular proximal tendon on the surface, anatomical predisposition to injury, and anatomical factors combined with regional hypovascularity delay in healing of thrust. I thought by myself, what is the relation with that? Maybe uh, we can, I can conclude that this beginning of the disease and with the natural course, after a while, it is becoming hypovascular. In the beginning, it was different. So I came to diagnosis. This is a slide that I like very much. I, when I have taken it from a friend. So two kangaroos are having good life, and but the kid is trying to feed the kangaroo. So this is, if you don't, know what you are looking for, you cannot see the real truth. So diagnosis, especially imaging is based on, you have to know what you are looking for. So we don't have any bone pathology. For every extremity disorder, we have to check X-ray. But what we can see with the X-ray is 25% we can see soft tissue calcification or some uh, bone prominence here. But the rest of the X-rays are mostly normal. What about MRI? It has low specificity, valuable for differential diagnosis, but for some cases, MRI gives us some uh, tendinous entosis part, uh, some detailed information. So it is not necessary for diagnosis, but there is an increased intensity of signal at the origin of origo, thickening edema, tendon degeneration. Sometimes they interpret it like tendon rupture. I will show you another MRI in the next slides. You can see that you can see it here. What about ultrasonography? 
requires experienced uh, operators, especially in the new fashion of ultrasonography, they have the soft tissue superficial probes. Those superficial probes are more sensitive than the other probes, but still it needs an experienced operator. Uh, the tendon appears to be thicker than hippoechoic, but the real thing is you have to see it. What I told you, you can see in this MRI, you can see here that there is the increased activity of the uh, hydrogen concentration. You can interpret it as tears, but with the other slices, you can see that little bit elongation here. You can see a little uh, change in signal, but it is not very essential, but it's more important for differential diagnosis. Any, any uh, other moment. Once I had a friend, he had a lateral epicondylitis, and I had the extra, he had a bone cyst over there. So it may have to be, have to make radiological exam to rule out that there are other associating pathologies. So we say that it is in the tendon. In the treatment, we can cut and suture the tendon. With the physical exam, uh, I'll show you. With the physical exam, we have to push the wrist extensors and try to create a tension and the extensor radialis brevis. Mostly, when we are examining, we make the tension in the old extensors, but our main part is, in my own practice, I try to push and this uh, forceful maneuvers, causing maneuvers. I just ask the patient where it's painful, but then with my finger, I try to understand the most painful part of it because Sometimes it is the bone part is very painful, even though you don't have to force them for extension, but with palpation, you force them, you just push the bone and you can see the pain. It means that, so it is the real part of the pathology. If you are going to make an injection, uh, uh, my, my preferred technique is, I just push the bone. I try to find the most painful part and then first I inject a local anesthetic. If the pain goes away, it means that I am at the right, right part. We come to non-operative treatment. So it is uh, prevention of the full contraction of the extensors. So this is, there have a lot of varieties of this. Orthosis of uh, lateral epicondylitis orthosis. The main idea is just push the tendon try to decrease the strain at the level of the epicondylitis. So it decreases 45% of the force transmission to the injured tendon. It should be placed two or three centimeters at this level to the epicondyle, just let the wrist to flexion. And we have a, a response rate of 80 or 90%. Mine is not that high. But with, according to Walter, it, it gets 80 or 90% respond to uh, rest and pain relief. You see that it compresses uh, that. This orthosis, some of them has a little bit cushion under it. I try to put the cushion over the extensor capradius brevis and longus. So it is the first choice of treatment. And uh, it should be combined with activity modification. I is non that. Uh, inflammatory medications, ultrasound or physical therapy, and the techniques like uh, tennis modification. But we have a lot of patients who are not tennis players, especially housewives. I always tell them when they are lifting something, try to lift them with their palm facing towards the upwards. So with this one, they, they lift them with the flexors instead of extensors. So this makes a great difference. And then uh, activity modification, depending on especially typewriters or people who are doing manual work, try to keep their elbow flexion, try to do it with the medial side. So it is not easy in the beginning, but by the time they get used to it, just let, let them know. For injection, I think injection are the most common way of uh, conservative treatment. We have a variety of injections. So it's steroid, Botox, autologous blood, PRP, acupuncture. This is uh, autologous blood. But you see, uh, I do it more 
uh, cleaning. This is not my uh, picture. First, I told you that I try to find the point of pain, and then I inject the local anesthetic with a insulin needle, which is a very small needle. And then I do less injection, less than one cc. And then I check the examination again. If after the steroid, if the patient is free of pain or just like 80 or 70% free of pain, it means that I am at the right spot. Then the choice comes. The first choice is without autologous blood or Botox or PRP, I try to make dry needling. So it is like I make uh, punctures with the same needle, maybe 10 or 15 to the painful area after the local anesthetic uh, blocking. It means that the idea behind this, we try to create a new wound over there. This new wound might have triggered healing. So it works most of the cases. If it is resistant to that, the second injection, I use steroids, but maybe 0.3 or 4 cc steroid. I do the same thing. First inject the local anesthetic, then in the second phase, I inject the steroid. For autologous blood and Botox, it is not very uh, traditionally in my practice, but it depends. And this is a third choice, especially. Uh, the Botox, Bot not Botox, but the PRP. With the corticosteroids, the response is variable, but the only thing is, if you put too much corticosteroid inside, you have fat atrophy, you, have, you might have some pigmentation, and it is an early response, five pain relief, but it doesn't last that long. So we have many papers uh, about uh, the best conservative treatment. Steroid injection is the best conservative treatment and non eontoperitic administration of dexamethasone sodium phosphate for acute epicondylitis. And in this study, it's also on the pro prosteroid. This is a Turkish paper, different, three different local injection modalities, randomized prospective trials, and also local injection treatment for lycopolycondylitis. All these papers give us good results about steroid injection for the early phase. But for the long term, one of the best papers, this three uh, papers is either steroid injection, physiotherapy, or wait and see. Wait and see means activity modification and some massage physiotherapy. At the sixth week, steroid injection is significantly better than the others. But at one year, 60% of good injection, uh, patients' injection has good result but 91% of the physiotherapy and wait and see patients have good result. So most of the papers say that in the early site, corticosteroid has good pain relief, but in the long run, it comes equal to the others. So when I was a resident, we were said that you have three rights for injection for corticosteroids. So after the third injection, there's, it is nonsense to make the fourth injection. So you can go for surgery, but now things are, changing or developing. So we have many various injection varieties. This is a concept of looking at the patient side. From one corner, you can say that we try to do as conservative as conservative. So we can try all the possibilities of injection. First dry needling, then you can save steroids, then PRP, autologous blast transfusion, then extracorporeal shock or some physiotherapy they have radio frequency as well. So you can go on like this. And it depends on the patient's characters. I know some patients, they want shortcut. They say that, well, what are the chances of having surgery or conservative? I need time. I don't, I'm not in that luxury. So if the injection fails, then I want to go to surgery immediately. The other group, they try to go away, get avoidance surgery as much as possible. So as a doctor, we, we propose them the possibilities and we explain them the risks and you know the costs and benefits of them and then for surgery. And many people don't want to go to surgery. So we explain that. With autologous blast injection, I don't have uh, much experience with that. 
if the patient needs an injection, we do PRP. But in this one, growth factor to enhance healing in musculoskeletal injuries, particularly in sport medicine. Autologous blood injections are true, taught to work by stimulating an inflammatory response, which will bring the necessary nutrition to promote healing. No benefit in the long-term follow-up. From my point of view, autologous blood infusion has no difference with PRP. It may be cheaper because VRP, there is a big commercial uh, site, grow up, a growth commercial site. So it goes for the patient, the company is making many, many different kinds of PRPs. And autologous blood has the same thing with less concentration. So I didn't find any papers comparing these two different injections, autologous blood injection and uh, PRP. They are the same. In PRP, you have the thrombocytes, and with this one, you have the plasma and other factors. PRP, it has the growth factors, and mostly about the platelets. The platelets is the real thing. Uh, you know, it's like a miracle in the beginning of sports medicine, industry especially, because sportsmen, are, their time is valuable. Their time is money. So they don't care is whether it's expensive or not. In the early traumas, I think it works because thrombosis, the platelets, is the first uh, triggering factors for the healing, especially in soft tissue, in, in minor injuries. In minor injuries, I totally agree with them. But in chronic cases, I still have the doubts and I still have the unclear mechanism in my eyes. So that's why it's not my first choice of treatment and injection. But if they are resistant, I can go with PRP. And PRP and whole blood injection, I told you that there is papers that there is no differences. And there may be some difference. The consent is different, but one is cheap. The other one is not that cheap. We come to wrist extension splints. So with the wrist extension splints, you prevent wrist extension. This is also coming to the same line, same mentality with the orthosis of the blocking of the origo. So if you don't let the wrist to extend and you don't, uh, you control the strain and the muscle at the origo. So this is easier than the other one. Uh, but for the wrist splint, many people, if they are manual workers, uh, with the elbow splint, it works better. It's more practical. They can do their job. But the, with the wrist splint, it is unpractical. Some of them complain that they prefer the elbow splint. And also, Lasers in our society also, they were in arthroscopy for a while, but laser everywhere. There are some laser users in the tennis elbows, but it's not become you know, the classic way of treatment. There are lasers and acupunctures. There are papers that they are effective, especially acupuncture is effective in the short-term relief of condition, because acupuncture is a very good relief, especially pain relief. Because if you release the pain, release the pain, then the pathology is over there, but as long as there's no pain, it works. But for the lasers, uh, the paper I have seen was that in the long term, it doesn't have any other uh, advantage. For extracorporeal shockwave treatment, you know that this shockwave is first used for, for the urodiasis. They were dividing the stones in the kidney and the urethra. And it is, if you can adjust the targeting point, it makes a injury at the bone, especially at the cortex. So this injury increases the blood flow and the vascularity, and it is effective. It is logical, but the problem is, you have to target the device and the amount of shock wave to be given. I have some cases that after they received uh, extracorporeal shockwave treatment, they have very, very severe pain. Probably they couldn't adjust the dose of it and it gives a little bit injury to the cortical side of the bone. So this is like a bone edema because they cause like a bone edema. It goes three or four weeks, which I have been also noticed in epicalcanae as well because they try to hit it over there. If you have more dose over than the overdose, then you have bone edema, which is painful for a while. Sometimes it may persist, but 
it is also used. I don't recommend as long as the patient is trying to go away from surgery. Uh, in, in my routine practice, I do injection and PRP. Uh, for some cases, if they want for the other choices, I refer them to extracorporeal shockwave treatment. There is another treatment. They are different. One is uh, shockwave treatment. The other one is pulse ultrasonography. So uh, one is more powerful. Shockwave treatment is more powerful. And pulse ultrasonography, some of my friends are using it for, <clears throat> especially in sports injuries for the stress fractures. It's also having the same mentality, but uh, the energy which has been transmitted by pulse ultrasonography less than the other one. So it is uh, two different things with the same mentality, but the power is different. Botox, I have never used Botox, but botulinum toxin is induced a period of temporary paralysis that gives the time for soft tissue pathology to recover. It sounds logical, but we are losing the power of extension. So it is has the same mentality. If you don't have a muscle contraction over there, then the then the, you're just getting rid of the reason. Then, but after a while, if you don't have the enough healing, then you go back to normal again. But you're losing that uh, a paralytic time for a while. So, but there is no consensus in the literature as to whether this technique gives any real benefit or not. So, but I have no shame. Physiotherapy, physiotherapy, you know, if you look at the, from the view of physiotherapy, they can do everything. They can solve all the problems. It works. If you think that is, there is no inflammatory cells, there is an inflammation fibrodysplasia. Uh, some of the modalities of physiotherapy may work for them, but it depends on the which phase of the disease. In an early phase, it is easier for the physiotherapist. But <clears throat> on the other side, we have the stretching exercises, especially, and try to teach the patients how to use their elbow, try to protect their uh, elbow flexors, especially the extensor elbow flexors, and try to teach them uh, using the medial flexors. Isokinetic exercises are more effective. So it is not the real solution. But after you start the treatment, and it works, and we need it. We need the complication. Sorry for this slide. It should be done in the other side. So we treat it. What are the complications? Especially after surgery, we have uh, iatrogenic injury of the ligaments. We might have missed some entrapments. Of course, in every surgery, we have iatrogenic neurovascular injury possibility. But the most uh, possible is heterotopic calcification because if you are dealing with the bone, then you might have, in two cases, I had it. So what if we decide surgery? What is the mentality behind surgery? The mentality behind surgery is release and debridement of the origin of the extensor radial spiritus. So it says so, but when we open the case, sometimes we might have some degeneration under extensor digitorum communis as well. So what are the indications? <clears throat> it depends. Some parts say that six, some parts 12 months of failed conservative treatment. And it should have a clear diagnosis, like it's an isolated lateral epicondylitis and it's an intraarticular pathology. What are the contraindications? Inadequate trial of non-surgical treatment. And if there is no compliance of the patient, recommended non-surgical treatment, then it might have a difficulty because if you don't have a compliant patient, surgery is more risky. We have two options for surgery. It's either open or arthroscopic. In open, we have the incision over the common extensor origin and located deep, excised degenerated tissue if we see, decorticate the epicondyle, repair the capsule if breached, and side-to-side -side closure of the tendon. So this is the uh, surgery on the papers, but in surgical treatment, some people don't close the wound. I mean, they don't repair the tendon, they don't repair the capsule. If you have an arthroscopic repair, you don't have to repair the capsule and the tendon. So it means that just touching there makes some difference. 
And we have also arthroscopic repairs. What are the advantages? We have to include visualization and ability to address intraarticular pathology. And reject lateral capsule. Do not pass mid radialors. Protect the lateral collateral ligament. Release the origin with where the muscle tissue begins. We can decorticate the lateral epicondyle. So what are the success rates? Open, you have a success rate of 70 or 97%. Percutaneous, you have 70 or 95 percent, but arthroscopic, you have 72 or 87 percent. So, more or less the same, same numbers. So, why then arthroscopic? Then we will come. This is a non surgical treatment. So, you just divide the tendon, and underneath the tendon, you can see that degenerative tissue. So, this is a different way of approach. Sure. So, we know that. It is at the origo of the tendon. So some cases, they do like that. Then they reach the origo here and just over the capitellum. So tensile overuse and angiofibroblastic tendinosis, we can see. This is the surgery which has been proposed by Nirsch in 1979. We have to have an intact soft tissue. There shouldn't be any previous surgery no postural pain, the mechanical symptoms. You see, this is the part. You see the capital? This is the radial head, ECRB just over it. You just release it with the capsule and clean up here. And there is not a defined part that everybody says that you should decorticate the cortex. How much you will decorticate? I mean, uh, decortication is a procedure that you just disrupt the cortex or you can get rid of the cortex totally. So uh, if I do open surgery, I decorticate it with a curette. Not very decortication, but I just make three or four holes with a key wire just to have the relation uh, of the decompression of the bone of the capitellum. Also, it is like a crimson duvet in shoulder surgery. You have blood over there then you have many uh, many molecules to promote healing. So this is extensor carpal radialis longus. So you don't have to release it. Sometimes you have to release it. And it depends. Uh, if you have a cleaning over there, I don't use any anchors. I just close the wound. It, when you close the wound, it means that you have closed the tendon as well. So because the defined surgery is beneath the extensor digitorum communis, you have the lateral collateral ligament. This is the capsular origin. Uh, sorry. So this is the capsular region. This is the lateral epicondyle. So this is the uh, lateral collateral ligament and the annular ligaments just under the extensor digitorum comics. So for annular ligament, you can open the capsule from the anterior part and you can see that you can make the maneuver that you don't cause any instability and that just clean up the here. Also, you can see the amount of tissue. So we have this triangle here, and you can see that uh, this is the same slide, same picture, a better one. You can have the lateral condyle, lateral collateral ligament, the annular ligament, and the extensor carpal here. So this is this is the real part. You can see some tissue here. This is a fibroelastic tissue. This is this was a very tight scar tissue, scarterized tissue. So you can open it and you can close it like that just over the cartilage. Underneath the cartilage, just clean up here. Sometimes you may have to open it a little bit wider incision. Then with that incision, you can close it or you can just... Uh, here, I never use anchors. I just make a hole with the, with the towel clip. I just pass my sutures at the bone door, you know, the auto grunt, the stronger sutures. It, it acts like an anchor because it's expensive. So this is... The distal part, you can see the head of the radius, but I don't go further, you see that. The head of the radius, because after this part, you have the annular ligament. So I try to keep the annular ligament intact. I don't want to disrupt the annular ligament. You see here, I don't, this is the radial head. I don't go further. You can see the protectant in this part. This is the case that I have told you in the beginning. So you see that there is a part here, it looks like uh, the signal of the water is a hydrogen signal. See, this is the degenerative tissue. This is 
the MRI of a tennis player. Uh, it's not very professional, but it's a lifestyle. Uh, this is in the long term, he has a rupture here. The tennis player has surgery. I just cleaned up here. Uh, but as he is, uh, as he needs his elbow more than the others, I did very careful cleaning and just make the debridement of the tissue. He is back uh, to course again because I operated him four months ago. He started exercises one month ago. Now he's going. What about arthroscopy? With the arthroscopy, uh, the question is, is it superior? Is it visualizing associated pathologies, especially with the capsule and the cartilage? Or is it risky? It is uh, definitely time consuming. It has definitely more complication and it's, it's uh, expensive. But just think of early stages of arthroscopy Everybody was against knee arthroscopy or shoulders in the beginning uh, years. But after some experience, you become faster. You can define and more different pathologies that you cannot see with upper open surgery. And then it will become valuable in the future. But elbow arthroscopy is uh, more difficult, or let me say it is learning curve is steeper than the others. But maybe the first reason is you don't have that often elbow arthroscopy. You do one, and if you're not especially working on elbows, then your case numbers is not that high. So you do something and then you forget it. Then three weeks later, you do another elbow arthroscopy. So, but still, with the elbow arthroscopy, you can see, you can see the cartilage, you can see the line, and you can make the debridement uh, from the place that you want. But you cannot see if the lesion is intratendinous, if your eyes are not, if you're not that experienced, you, you cannot differentiate it from the normal tissue. So these are the arthroscopy setup. This is a picture of mine, has been taken at 2002. Was, and this was the place, uh, I was using it for wrist arthroscopy because I just manufactured to the guy and I can have that. I was holding here. If I am going to work on the anterior compartment, I was doing in this position. Because my first elbow arthroscopy case, I have watched it with, with from uh, Luigi Pedersini in Italy. He is a very good friend of my wrist and elbow. He is one of the big uh, elbow arthroscopists in Europe. He says the highest number in Europe. He was doing like that. But if you are going to, if I'm going to do it on the posterior compartment, I use this one. Now I still at the same side, because if I have a posterior pathology, I use this position. Of course, we have better instruments now because we have a shoulder positioner, so I can, uh, I don't use this part, I use the shoulder positioner, just give the uh, elbow the demand position. And for, for the wrist, I use the same position like that. In that arthroscopy, you can see inside the Inside the capsule, you can see the tears and you know the morphologic changes in the capsule. So you can see the main idea with the arthroscopic treatment of just to release extensor radialis from the lateral condyle. This is a very old picture. This is the arthroscopists can recognize this. This is the Smith and Nephew's 4.5 millimeters uh, cannula which is not in the market now, but it was a great candidate, especially for elbow. It's 4.5 with the same size of the arthroscope. So you can have a cannula inside over that, through that cannula, you can clean up. So I try to see the fibers of the muscle. This is just to release from the bone. But I don't know how much tissue I debride because I cannot see it from this part, those cases. And also, when you are doing arthroscopy, after a while, you become familiar with the tissues. So now you see the capsule, this is the capsule. These are the muscle fibers. So you don't go halfway of the radius because you have to clean up. You have to clean up the lateral condyle. And also, this is the radius. We are going to try to make it more proximally. But when you are cleaning, you see that I try to keep 
the capsule of the, the annular ligament of the radius intact. So I try to go between the radial head and the epicondyle. Sometimes you have to change the portals. So uh, this is the case that I use the wrist arthroscope because with the wrist arthroscope, we have, uh, especially with the Brent Smith and nephew, you have the cannulas and the shavers with that. So you can, the only problem with that, the length. So this is, if you have a port leash, I just try to shave it. Because with the suction, this is the radial head. You see, there are some tissue here. With the suction, you are going to see that it comes towards to you. So you see, this is the same case. We have a suspicion of, this is an old case as well, suspicion case of the thick eye as well. So I try, I try to clean as much as possible, especially over the radius and the lateral epicondyle. In the beginning, you don't see, but you can see the ruptures, or let me say the irregular part of the capsule. You see, you see this is a synovial tissue here. You see the synovia, we cleaned up the synovia here. And inside the capsule, you can see the the fiber seeds, you know, that these are the minor ruptures. This is the radial head of the cleaner. What we see, I told you that we see with the arthroscopy the advantages of radiocapitular cartilage injuries associated with tennis elbow. So it means that you can see the cartilage differences. And this is the pictures from this paper. This is another picture. This is taken from the presentation of Michael Hausmann. Michael Hausmann is a very experienced hand and elbow surgeon, but he has many attempts of arthroscopic solutions. So this is uh, the side of synovitis on the radial head. With the tennis elbow, you have synovia on the radial head because uh, you can see that the altered mechanics of the elbow may cause different synovias, especially with arthroscopy. If you see synovia somewhere, it means that there's something wrong over there. So radiocapital injuries are not that common, but he says that uh, about 65% of the tennis elbow cases, not all the cases, it means that if you go to surgery for tennis elbow, it means that it's a very chronic and old lasting patient. And radial head, uh, it means that capitalum was 65% and radial head was 81% of 31 elbows. It is a big number. So it means that a lot of cases have. And also, uh, there is another study of Yamashita, which is a good study. It's he, he put some uh, calculation devices the effect of elbow and forearm position and contact pressure between the extensor region and lateral side of the capitella. So which is the most squeezing position? So it is the most squeezing position is elbow flexed, pronated, and flexed and pronated position is the much stress on the uh, extensor carpalis and expressive muscles. So when we are trying modification, we have to advise this as well to the patients. So this is another paper presentation with Paolo Arigoni from Milano. He is an elbow surgeon. And he says that in the cases, most of the cases, you can see that you can sign away at the radial head. But he says that there is an inflammation and increase in the fluid. And this increase makes elongation with the ligaments. So it means that there is a small, the cases especially, uh, there is a symptomatic minor instability of the lateral elbow which has been published in the knee surgery sports and traumatology. And he says that this elongation causes minor instability. And this may be an explanation for the cartilage uh, injuries at the capitellum or radial head. But in the case that if you see any with arthroscopy, uh, synovial hypertrophy inside, it means that you have to tighten, you have to check the stability and tension of the ligaments. So we come to differential diagnosis. We might have a posterior plica. We might have instability. 
but this is more severe instability, which may have a previous injury and postural rotatory instability. We have radial tunnel syndrome, especially this is not very frequent, but we have to be aware of it. There might be ocular fractures, cervical radiculopathy, capitellar osteochondritis dissecans, maybe confused with triceps tendinitis. That's why I always ask the pain point of the patient. Sometimes maybe very close to the insertion of the triceps. Uh, it may be radiocapitellar arthritis or shingles. So we come to radial tunnel. Radial tunnel is not very frequent, but we see it, with, which is very proximal, which is three centimeters uh, proximal to the supinator from the place that we open. We can see that it is in between the two heads of supinators. There are also a lot of variations in the supinator muscle. Some of them has single head, some of them has two different heads. And it is also maybe uh, tethered under frosse arc, which 68% is membranous, 32% fibrous. If it's a fibrous arc, we can see it very easily, but it's, it's a membranous. It is easy to just not see it, so just neglect it. So this is the place, a big, it's a, it's a thick nerve, it's at least three millimeters, it goes into the spinatal muscle. But the character of the pain is different. It's a, the PIN syndrome's pain is more like burning pain, especially a forearm proximal, especially the pain increases in the pronation, spination. Try to ask them to make pronation and spination because flexion is not, doesn't make any change. So it's, just reactivate the supinator muscle. We have EMG, of course. EMG might be false negative because you have to make it tire it a little bit, but you have, uh, you might have sometimes the muscle symptoms, the, the power loss with the muscles. So we have to make a clear neurologic exam as well. Try to make a neurologic exam. Try to understand the character of the pain and Always, I try to make a sensory examination as well, especially with the forearm and the hand. So these are the cases. You can see the tick and uh, yeah, you follow it till the end because uh, there may be double crash as well. So I try to uh, follow the nerve till, till the forearm. I had two cases, I, could, I forgot to put them inside. And I had two cases of release with minimal invasive, uh, like using the Hoffman device of Storz company for endoscopic guided nerve release. So I just put the endoscopy inside just to make the Hoffman device distractors, try to make a space, try to use the endoscope to follow the forward one. It works, but we need more time because uh, we, it is difficult to uh, adjust your cerebellum to that. You have somebody else is holding the camera. Maybe you may modify a camera holder and in the future maybe, the future will be more minimal invasive. So you can see the heads of the uh, supinator. In some cases, you can see the flattened nerve. It is very really obvious, uh, the entrapment. Sometimes it may not be that obvious, but it always gives good results, 60 or 70%. And this good and excellent results come because the rest of the 30%, they have very long lasting entrapment. So it is difficult for, for the nerve to recoach. The pelica syndrome is like, it's the pelica just squeezing in between the radius and capitellum. Especially there's a popping and snapping when you have a flexion extension device. The most well-known person is Sean O'Driscoll. He is from Mayo Clinic. Sean at the school showed, I have this in one of his presentations. He said that I have a plica syndrome. When I do like this, I have the click. So, but if you have a plica syndrome with clicking, no complaints, it's okay. But if it's combined with the pain, you should keep you in your mind that it may be a plica as well. Try to uh, think it in your mind. So this, this is the real diagnostic thing is for this physical exam. Physical exam findings are the most, uh, let me say, dominant thing on diagnostic decide decision. So this is also, you can see the plica, it's a little bit fried, but arthroscopically 
you can clean it. Arthroscopy is preferred and especially in plica, you can see the other parts of the joint as well. You can also have it open, but I prefer arthroscopy. And these are the papers as well, it says both kinesiotherapy, also in the new fashion in the physical therapy in the last years. The mentality of kinesiotherapy is just, you just bandage the skin, you just distract it from the underlying fascia. It means that they increase the circulation. So increase on circulation is helps for maybe triggering healing or pain loss, because it's widely used, especially in shoulders and other source of pains. So kinesiotherapy says that significantly they both improve pain and with the new diagonal high. However, these improvements were more prominent in the kinesiotherapy group. So kinesiotherapy is better than um, with the uh, extracorporeal shock therapy. And again, extracorporeal shock therapy did not show clinically important improvement in pain reduction. So symptom duration longer than six months. In the long run, there is not too much difference. With PRP and autologous blood injection, do not improve pain at one year follow-up. They also have more or less the same uh, reactions. This paper says that PRP injection was not superior to placebo. And this paper we stress need for well-designed uh, trials to be understood, which of these operative techniques is really superior to the others. Why did I put these papers at the end of my presentation? So it means that it's consensus on the treatment. Everybody says that uh, still we need more evidence for that. So, but uh, still this is, this is a slide that I use a lot in the most in you, you, you may not be that skilled. So it means that every surgery needs the power to cope with the complications of it. So briefly, my personal preference, I try to go as much as conservative, especially if they are housewives, if they are not professionals, if they are not in an emergency that need their elbow function. But if they go surgery, if they are not that sophisticated, if, they am, if I am not suspicious of any cartilage injury inside, because it's like the lateral side of the elbow as well, and, and it's not time consuming and it's cheap. So I mean, I'm working in the private now. So it is arthroscopy and open surgery is almost double side expensive on the patient side as well. But if I uh, suspect of other pathologies, I go arthroscopic surgery. So my ratio of arthroscopy and open is one force. But uh, assuming that it's not that much uh, incidence of the, because we don't operate too many tennis elbows. So we go, we don't do tennis elbow arthroscopy that often. Thank you. This is the end of my uh, presentation. I think I should stop sharing. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you, probably, uh, Mohamed. Maybe. Sorry, it, uh, it, it, it's a long time. I talked too no, long. I talk no, no, too no. Long. I, think, I think today I learned everything about tennis elbow because I didn't know about many, 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 many things of tennis elbow. We thought that it's a very small topic and very negligible topic in orthopedic. We always thought that it is not my job. It's a physiotherapy job to treat the tennis elbow. But uh, mind you, today I learned a lot. I'm very sure the other panelist is going to contribute. Sanjay Yes, uh, excellent presentation. I learned many new things today. My one question is, what is the uh, reason for the recurrence after successfully treating tennis elbow once and how to deal with that? What is your threshold for surgery after how many recurrences? So, not the recurrence, but the pain, relief and comfort. Uh, because, and I do, you know, that I am pro conservative. I try to do conservative treatment as long as possible. Because with surgery, I had two cases of heterotopic ossification. One of them was a manual workish. So he's, he's, he's a, you know, construction business. He has to use, he, he needs powers. So once you have heterotopic ossification, the chance of relax left is high. And 
with the injection, my policy is first I do dry needle injection. With the, first I do local anesthetic injection, it is pain free. Then I repeat it for three times because with the injection, they can survive three or four months and they say that it started again. So I do the same thing again. And 30% of them are coming back again. Then I do steroids. And if they had steroid before somewhere else, I do dry needling first. And if dry needling relapses, I go for PRP. I don't know the real mechanism of PRP, but I go for PRP because it's sophisticated. It's a part of placebo as well. Some patients want to check and try the, the other possibilities. With surgery, I don't do too much uh, decortication. I make the holes in the cortex, just to let some blood come out of the cortex. I don't use any anchors. Uh, if I release the CRB, I just suture it not to the bone with it, just, I just pass the suture from the bone with a hole that I create with towel clip. So it's, uh, some patients, they have, uh, two patients of mine, they are the guys that I make repairs. You know that the orthocord suture made reaction. You can feel the suture underneath the skin. I did, one of them, I made a revision, I just pull out the sutures. So that's, that is the reason of the, not failure, but they go. I don't have a referring me all the time. I had two revisions like that. They were the sutures, but the rest is okay. And also two patients with heterotopic ossification. But I try to avoid as much as surgery. If they insist on that, I am like in a relief that, I mean, I tried everything. So, because it's always, we are surgeons, we do a lot of surgery, but on the other side, we had, we had to have a good defense. With defenses, I try to avoid surgery, but now it's the natural course. That's not the first choice. Because patients don't go, not say angry, but they are not frustrated with failing with the conservative treatment, but they frustrate with the failure in surgery. Mehmet, if, if, if I can ask you, about uh, the exact pathology, because I think there has been very conflictive report. Whether the tennis elbow is because of the epicondylitis, that is a bone lesion, or it is the uh, tendinitis, the tendon lesion. Because, because I'll tell you the reason where, because when we treat it, many of us are treating the bone lesion by injecting inside the bone. We are treating uh, on, uh, injecting onto the tendon. Sometimes we do a microfracture so that we can get a bone. So does it mean that it's a mixed pathology of tendon as well as a bone or it is isolated tendon pathology? I think it's a mixed pathology of tendon and bone because it is an entasis. It's the interface of tendon and bone. Like the, like the other entasis parts of the body. So it's a mixed pathology. It's the pathology of periosteum and the tendon. You know that I try to, I review the literature, I try to give you the papers, uh, try to share you the papers. In the beginning, there's no, uh, there's the inflammatory cells, it's the vascularity. But after a while, the vascularity is diminishing. So that's why they say that the tendon rupture is because of the lack of vascular supply. So different histopathology and different stages of the pay, uh, disease. So it is, about pathology of the bone, periosteum, and the and the tendon. Okay. Anybody else want to ask question? Question. I have got two questions. Yes, Rajkumar. Yes. Uh, Doctor Mehmet, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I have got two questions for you. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are audible. Yes. Okay. The first question for you is: It is always that uh, ERCB is the one which is implicated in uh, tennis elbow. Though we have a group of muscles, uh, you know, originating from lateral epicondyle, why it is only ERCB? Is it genetically, you know, or uh, some predisposing factor is there that this muscle should be involved? That is question number one. Question number two is we always see patients being prescribed a brace around the elbow. Uh, is it okay to prescribe that or uh, it should not be prescribed? Is the second question. Mehmet, he wants to ask why ECRB is involved commonly in tennis elbow. Is there any genetic predisposition with ECRB? 
I think uh, there is not a written answer for that, but because of the uh, just the evaluation after this presentation, I show you the paper of Tanaka, the Japanese papers, which is the uh, which position is the pressure between the tendon and the capitellum is the position of ECRB's functioning position, flex and pronation. So ACRB is not the muscle involved, only muscle involved in this. Sometimes extensor digitorum communis is uh, associating in this one. My personal uh, observation is ECRB plus ETRL as well, also extensor carpalidialis fungus as well. So if you refer to the cases that I didn't operate, but I know their physical examination, when I press their elbow like that, it is mostly the location of ECRB because it is the most prominent side of the epicondyle. It means that my explanation is not proven. It's not written an article. It is coming from the bone, which is most prominent side of the bone. That's the place that where ECRB is joining. So as uh, Russian Dr. Wadis asked me the question, is it the bony origin or tendinous origin? This is a pro bony and tendinous combination. So this is the part that the most prominent part of the epicondyle. That's my explanation. So otherwise I don't have a proven answer for that. The second question is, Brace. I use, yeah, I use the uh, orthesis very often and it works in my patient like 50%, 50%. If you teach them how to use it because they have to use it tight. If it's loose, then it's nonsense that there's no strain decreasing here. So the mentality is you just squeeze it here. You just carry the origo from here to, to the forearm. So if they don't squeeze it, then it doesn't work. So I, I am pro using splint. So this is the most cheapest and easy thing. So how long I insist on for that? If they say that it doesn't make any difference, I go for three weeks. If three weeks there is no response for it, then, then oh, I switch to other modalities. Uh, Anybody else? Uh, uh, Roshan, continuing that uh, question. Yes, Roshan. yes, yes. If we squeeze and use the brace too tightly, are we going to, you know, increase the pain that is coming out from the superficial radial nerve there? If you use it too tight, I didn't use, I didn't notice any increase in the pain because the pain is more proximal, but you can decrease the venous return. So you can make some vascular occlusion over there. So the hand swells. So I advise them, try to make it as tight as possible as long as there's no swelling in your hand because of the squeezing the veins. Yeah. So uh, is there any question, Pratap, Anil? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, uh, Anil. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Dr. Mehmet, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes can I can hear you. You were in the car. Yeah. When I was starting, yes, you were yes, in the car. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Now, I have a question. You know, we have so many surgeons now who are very aggressive of uh, treating this tennis elbow. Now, many of them even being, uh, you know, arthroscopic, uh, you know, uh, surgeons. Uh, you may have an entity where you have a young sportsman who's already been operated elsewhere. Now, he comes back with a similar, uh, you know, incidence. He comes back with a pain. Now, how do you uh, manage these cases? Like in your entity, you might have seen such cases. It is difficult because if it, they are operated in a different place, you don't have yes. the create detailed information about the operation. What you can do is, yes. uh, which is the onset of the pain? Where is the pain starts? I mean, just back to physical examination again. And I yes. definitely ask for an MRI for them. So I try to really yes. understand the origin of the pain is it from the bone tendon interface or is it yes. a bone edema or tendon so i do the yes. same thing but i try to uh, refrain it as much as possible so it is because once they are operated i always tell them your doctors must have done the right thing because it is difficult to do a wrong thing because this is simple you just release and clean up the tissue yes. so yes. you should be an idiot to make a wrong operation yeah yes. or malpractice so they are difficult. I don't have, I only have one case okay. and I did redo. It was not that bad. He is okay. Sometimes relapsing again, but I don't have, I mean, like redo experience a lot.
But my policy is try to say that your doctor must have done the right thing. He cannot do a wrong thing. Sometimes it's yes. persistent. We will do the same mm -hmm. thing again. Yes. Just as the, the, the expression, yes. we will do the same thing again. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Pratap? Yes. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, Okay. Please, 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 uh, please come to come close to your uh, computer because I think your voice is breaking. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear yes, you now. I can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I just want to ask you, what is your opinion on multiple drilling when you are doing open surgery? Like Sorry. I, surgery. Yeah, what multiple is... multiple drilling during open surgery, Mehmet. Ha, multiple drilling. It's, it's a micro fracture. It's coming from <coughs> arthroscopic background. If you do, you know, Steven Snyder yeah. is a good shoulder surgeon. He has a, a word named that crimson duet. It means the red blanket. If you make holes in the bone, then the blood comes out. With the blood, you have the growth factors and some factors. It means it is an unclarified uh, healing triggers inside. So that's why I do three or four holes in the epicondyle at the cortex. So I want some bleeding. I think that it will help, but it needs a control study, the ones that we have done or not, because I don't have a volume like that. I don't have a control study like that, but the current practice, I do it. I think that it will be safer because drilling the epicondyle doesn't make anything worse. Any, any other question? Or we'll move on to the next question. Talk. Question, yes. can I? Ask yes, yes, JP. Yeah, yeah. And then usual. Yeah, this is uh, regarding arthroscopic debridement. Uh, yeah. Tell us easy tips uh, to identify ECRB inside through the arthroscopy. Do you have any easy tips to identify the ECRB during arthroscopy? <coughs> yes, because if you see in the anatomy slides, it is just over the radial head. Just if you have working in a flexed elbow, just over the radial head is the ECRB in a 90 degree flex position, okay? Uh, Ujwal? So you like this, you have, let me show you like that. So okay. this is over the radial head, just yeah. underneath the, the radial head, over the radial head is the ECRB, okay? Yes. If you follow the radial head and just uh, what you say, root, after the, red, the upper border of the uh, flexor border of the radial head, then as the insertion of ECRB. Okay, Ujwal, you have any question for Dr. Mehmet? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, is there any role of isolated uh, infraspinal to strengthening physiotherapy in a any yeah. uh, elbow patient? Many times we find that patients have weakness of uh, infraspinatus. Well, actually. I don't have knowledge about it, but physiotherapy always helps. It's not the only solution, but if, if the patient is an active guy, it is easier or more safer to ask him to work with a physiotherapist because they can calculate the muscle balance. But the one that you told me, I don't have knowledge about it. It's not logical because their external rotators are weak, then there is more load on the elbow external rotation, but I don't have confirmed knowledge about it. Sorry to. Okay. So is there any question to Dr. Mehmet before we go on to Dr. Ujwal Deliwala's presentation? Ujwal, are you ready? Yeah, just a minute. Uh, you have to share, you open your presentation in desktop, then okay. share, share the screen with the presentation on your share button. Thanks, Bolna Roshan. Okay, I thank you for the invitation. No, uh, and just no but you, are, you, are you going, Dr. Mehmet? You yeah, I'm here, but I will, yeah, I will just give five minutes break. Pause so. Because we, we are not ended yeah, the session. I am here. I am here. I am here. Yes, yes, yes. Is it visible? Yeah, now it's visible. Okay. Yes, I'll just I mute all. I'll, I'll just mute all. Okay. So, so that I'm we late. can. I'll mute everyone so that speaker can uh, speak. Yes. Ujwal, you can go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Excellent demonstration of pathophysiology of the tennis elbow, as well as uh, thanks Arthroscope Academy for the inviting me. Special thanks to Dr. Roshan, still working full fledged in lockdown four in India. 
basically, I was given orthobiologics role in tennis elbow, but I am sure that I am very much conscious about using other orthobiologics rather than PRP for tennis elbow because the how the way orthobiologics works in tennis elbow for PRP is entirely different. Like they are not working as similar as stem cells, mesenchymal cells, or bone marrow. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, as the professor mentioned, the basic case of physiology is there. There is a repeated injury, and that leads to no acute inflammatory cells. And there is a loss of uh, longitudinal alignment of the collagen fibers. And ultimately, there is an angiofibromatic hyperplasia over there. Uh, we already have seen all the treatments regarding the injection therapy for uh, selecting PRP or orthobiologics. And there are some disappointing things of uh, using NSAIDs because they interrupt with the inflammatory cycles. And sometimes patient may permit patient to ignore the pain and cause further injuries, apart from the other side effects of the steroid like skin discoloration and atrophy. So what is PRP? So PRP is a simply whole blood that is centrifuged to create an increased concentration of platelets with or without WBC. Uh, the main role of the PRP uh, is the activated platelet leads to release of growth factors. So that is the more important in regenerating healing response to the uh, pathological area. So what is so special about the platelets? There are, in platelets, there are con contains granules that contains large number of growth factors and activation of the platelets and the release of various growth factors. That makes the special about the PRP use among the orthobiologics for the tennis elbow. We know that in the chronic tendinopathy, there is a uh, repeated injuries that leads to less lack of inflammatory response and hypovascularity. This vicious cycle is broken by the PRP. If you go on the Google and internet, anything and everything right now, I mean, the current scenario can be treated with PRP, but that is maybe some hype. That is not true in all the ways. As orthopedicians, we know there is a definite role of PRP in meniscus repair, uh, some ligament repair surgery, ACL, but there is a doubtful role in tendon pathologies. So we will see later on how it works with literature evidence base. Uh, by definition, uh, there should be three to four times higher platelet concentration. If the normal is 1.5 to 3.5, like then it should be around 1 million platelets in a um, material if it is called as a platelet-rich plasma. So if you see methods, there are more than 100 methods in the uh, literature for the how to make the PRP. And uh, there is a simple classification given in 2009 that is like pure PRP, leukocyte-rich PRP, pure platelet, and platelet and leukocyte-rich fibrin. So I'm sharing my little experience of the PRP uh, from around the last nine years. Uh, there are 32 patients I have treated uh, for all the people among 26 pair of 10, 10 elbow and two were gold for elbow. Uh, all the tennis elbow patients, female were housewife. One male patient was a uh, uh, sports professional player. Three were recreational player. There, uh, there was surprisingly 23 patients out of 26 of tennis elbow has already been taken uh, local steroid, and more than 16 has taken more than two times of local steroids. Uh, we included all the those patients they have conservative failure of conservative trial of six months and NSAIDs has been intensely stopped seven days before and two weeks after the PRP infection injection because they may inhibit growth growth factor function. So this is the summary. Uh, most of the patients of the tennis elbow has already been uh, taken conservative conservative treatment and. Uh, most uh, 23 out of 26 patients has already been uh, injected more than two times for steroid injection. From beginning of 2010 to 11 around, I was in government hospital and I used to take around 150 ml of the patient's own blood. And then we centrifuged two times and we got around 15 ml of PRP. We divide in three vacuums and we store and we inject one week interval. Then after, as the technology advanced, there are two times centrifugation, but only 30 ml of blood required for highest kind of uh, PRP preparations. There's a 10 ml of PRP prepared and it, it has six, six times more platelets than the uh, original platelet count. It requires 20 minutes only, but still it is costly. So after 2015, when I was trained with Professor Dobi, that I came to know the uh, single centrifuge system and that includes 8 ml of lotologous blood that prepares 4 ml of PRP and, and the concentration of the platelet is around 3.5 times of the 
base them. That requires only 10 minutes. It is very much cost effective. This can be done in open basis. Only 30 minutes required. Need 10 ml syringe, 18 gauge spinal needle, and 20 gauge needle for injection. As the method shown by the professor, uh, that we mark the painful area. Then uh, there are multiple holes made by the needle, and then we inject leukocyte rich PRP with 18 gauge needle. USB guided can be helpful. Post injection usually we give advice of using ice application and SID stroke for the two weeks. Centric physiotherapy, slow stretching physiotherapy, low weight, pain free movement, and no high load activity until the patient meets the criteria that there is no local tenderness, mini, uh, re no rest pain, and full motion with normal strength. Complications are very less with the autologous PRP injections, and even in a single stage, they become almost nil. A local reaction may be occur, but it will subside within one or two days with ice applications. Uh, outcome all the patients evaluated with the VAS score. Uh, around 60% patient improve at the six weeks, but around 90% patients has been improved by six months and one year. While two stage blood bank PRP technique, there are only 40 patients improve at one year. So this is the technique I learned with professor that autologous blood collection, centrifuge at 3,500 uh, speed for five minutes. PRP is created after centrifuge. So this was the technique I learned with uh, professor Gobi was when I was in 2015 at Milano, Italy with Indian Cartilage Society Fellowship. And I had hands-on for this also, uh, where, how to make and how to apply it. So why I have selected this ambulatory PRP uh, technique? Because it does not require specialized blood service units, laboratory setups. We just require PRP centrifuge only. And allowing us to independently prepare PRP. No need for hospitalization. Time is only 30 minutes, economic. It is very cost effective and same preparation for the all kind of other tendinopathies. As professor says that literature is very mystery, there is no common consensus. But if we go the uh, publication before 2010, they shows that return to sport is good with PRP injections. And sometimes at one year follow up, they are good with the PRP injection rather than the placebo injection. This was the identical article in 2006 by Alan they show that 60% improvement at two, uh, two months and around 90% improvements continue even at two years also. But if you see the last five years papers that uh, among the PRP, the same, uh, same author has publication in American Journal of Sports Medicine with randomized control trial, level two evidence, multicentric. They show that initially uh, they needle the local site and then in one group PRP injected and one there was no injection. There was no difference at three months, but six months there was improvement. If you compare the literature for PRP comparison with steroid injection, initially the literature, all the articles in last five years says good improvement, but the improvement declines after three or six months. Uh, PRP comparison with arthroscopic release, the level two trial, uh, level two study, randomized control trial in Journal of uh, Arthroscopy, they say that both are effective, but the pain relief is good at the end of two years in a surgical group. So that may be a favor of surgical release of, for, compared to the PRP. But if we see in details whether the needle genotomy is working or PRP injection is working, then again, it is a mysterious, it is just like devil is in the details. So if you see this article in Journal of Orthopedic Research last year only, that they compared the two group and in the, they saw the similar improvement even if you do needle tenotomy and you inject either PRP or you inject, either inject lignocaine. So the human tenotomy is the key for the improving and uh, stimulating the healing response as so, said by the professor. So after uh, this literature, but in my practice, initially I was doing open, then I tried arthroscopic release, but ultimately, I found good results with the PRP, but uh, there are some limitation of PRP. There is uh, lack of an optimal dose of PRP, how much we should inject, lack of standardized preparation for the PRP. And as well as which methods, I, time will say, recently some legal issues to pure PRP used by FDA that uh, by def Usual, we can't hear you. Usual, hello.
हेलो डॉक्टर उज्ज्वल आई थिंक वी आर लॉस्ट डॉक्टर उज्ज्वल ओके दैट वाज द एंड ऑफ हिज टॉक अदरवाइज आल्सो बिकॉज आई थिंक दैट वाज द लास्ट स्लाइड इज देयर एनी क्वेश्चन टू डॉक्टर उज्ज्वल या इज देयर एनी क्वेश्चन टू डॉक्टर उज्ज्वल एनीबॉडी वांट्स टू आस्क एनीथिंग we have a small video on how to do the tennis elbow release i'll request yeah. dr prashan prashan can you hear me can you share the video uh, yes yes yeah it's a small video technique how to do it in fact it is published in uh, last uh, this was presented in aos prashan uh, no no okay. uh, yet to publish yet to publish so it's a very small technique which is uh, dr prashan from my institute has uh, innovated and uh, yeah please go ahead i'll just yeah, uh, good good evening everyone uh, thank you for the opportunity so this is a presentation okay go ahead prashan okay so this is a small video presentation on a arthroscopic uh, ecrb release uh, as a uh, professor has told initially the benefits and the pros and cons of doing arthroscopy or the uh, open surgery so uh, it's like a direct visualization of the joint and you can address the concomitant pathology like senovel plica or the one of the case like uh, we have this uh, high grade athlete who presented with the lateral elbow pain and given some injection but if you see his uh, the radial head has, has got a contra lesion so he was basically having the uh, the radial head pathology not the, actually the ec uh, ecrb pathology uh, and of course the arthroscopy has a small incision and the faster rehab as compared to the open procedure but as uh, it comes with the advantage it comes with the disadvantages as well so it is a technically demanding procedure unlike the other shoulder and uh knee joint the joint space is uh, quite small here uh, small working space and close proximity of the neurovascular structure especially the ulnar nerve uh, it can be damaged in the un untrained hand so i'm i'm presenting here a, a technique of uh, ecr release so she is a, a house wife by occupation suffering from the uh, ecr pathologies almost for uh it to 10 months and uh, she has received all uh, all sort of non surgical treatment and she has not relieved uh, with the pain so as you can see here uh, the, there is a ecr lesion in the uh, common extensor origin and uh, this patient already received the steroid uh, and uh, and non all the non surgical so uh, uh, we plan for the arthroscopic release so this is a, a semi lateral position and uh, we have two portals uh, for the uh, arthroscopic release one is intermedial and one is on the uh, lateral side so the lateral side is your working portal uh, that uh, you have the medial side we have a viewing portal so this is on lateral side proximal uh, anterolateral and the anterolateral portal two portals uh, we use the anterolateral portal so this is your posterior side olecranon radial head and the soft spot uh, as as a procedure we have to inject in the soft spot or uh, to distend the joint so that all the neurovascular structure should fall back more anteriorly and should not have any problem Uh, or should not cause any neurovascular damage while making your portal so coming to the medial side uh, medially we have two portals uh, proximal uh, anteromedial portal and the uh, anteromedial portal and this is the ulnar nerve which is just behind the uh, medial epicondyle so i'm already in inside the joint uh, this is again i'm marking the portals and once uh, you are inside the joint uh you start looking at the radial head above the capitulum on the medial side of the trochlea and the coronoid look for any uh, synovitis or look for any other pathology like one i have shown in the uh, first slide like professor has shown that you should may have a synovitis or some the capsular thickening inside the joint or some contralesion at the radial or you may have the some lesion at the capitulum as well so uh, this is another technique for the beginners once you, if you want to make the lateral side portal you just drive your 
trochar and cannula through the uh, lateral side and you can make a, uh, your uh, portal on the lateral side by just driving in. So take out the scope and introduce your shaver through that, otherwise you'll damage your lens. And once you are in, uh, slowly uh, withdraw your uh, shaver, but keep in joint and then uh, put your lens. So that's, that is one uh, way or otherwise you can just under region, you can make a portal like uh, with the needle, uh, like for shoulder or knee. So once uh, you are in uh, with the shaver uh, blade, you can push your capsule and clay and you can make your more space to see what's uh, wrong inside. So this white glistening uh, capsule inside uh, looks everything fine. And once you have made your uh, entry, start making uh, the debriding the capsule. So uh, after debridement, whatever structure you are seeing is your ECRP. And uh, you have to keep uh, very uh, close to the radial and capitular equator. Otherwise, like what professor has shown, it should not go below the uh, mid, uh, uh, radial capitular uh, equator. Otherwise, you're going to damage your uh, radial collateral ligament. So this is just anatomy. Somebody had asked question in between the uh, where exactly we should locate the ECRP. So this is your anatomy. This is your brachialis, ECRL, carpal longalis, and just below the extensor carpal longalis, there is a ECRP. Uh, whatever structure you see uh, after uh, breaking your capsule. So this is what I was talking about the capsule. Your, uh, your debridement area should stay about this lesion. If you go below, uh, you are likely to damage the uh, lateral collateral and patient may have post-surgery the instability and patient may be unhappy after that. So uh, once you uh, did your debridement, start debriding the ECRP. So this is what you are seeing is a ECRP. At this stage, uh, either you can use the shaver blade or you can use the radio frequency probe and you can take it, uh, debride the ECRP. So this is uh, inside, top is extensor carpalis longus, the middle is ECRP, and just below the uh, radial head is your uh, extensor digitum communis. So where to stop means what point you will stop after your debridement. Once you see that red muscle, your debridement uh, is, is complete. Once you start, uh, means once you complete your white structure of your tendon. So this is your end point of your surgery. So you can do uh, either with the your shaver or you can do with your radio frequency, uh, the RF probe, whatever you're comfortable with, it is okay. So this is your end point. And post-surgery, I don't uh, use the uh, suture. You just use the sterile sterile strips that gives you a good scar uh, post-operatively. So this patient uh, after surgery is fine and look at those uh, scar there is absolutely almost no scar you can visibly see that so post operatively uh, they go to physiotherapy department for rehab the most of these the patient uh, which are uh, the non athletic group or other non highly demanding group should be back in a phase 2 or one phase 2 almost close to 3 weeks they will go back to their previous work those are highly demand, they continue to strengthen their extensor and then go back to the uh, work. So to conclude, arthroscopy uh, of uh, elbow is, uh, has its own advantage and disadvantage. Stay within safe zone, like what I've shown in the stay above the radio capitular equator, otherwise you will damage your lateral collateral. So as professor has shown in multiple slides that the outcome of the open or surgery is functionally is equal or more or less some infection in um, an open procedure, but the functional outcome is almost equal. So uh, if you find any difficulty, there is uh, nothing wrong with the open procedure. Do not hesitate to convert to uh, an open procedure. So if you are uh, occasionally doing uh, elbow arthroscopy, then don't pick up your phone, uh, pick up the knife, pick up your phone, uh, call your friend and patient insist for arthroscopic release and just refer uh, them to the for surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant, for a wonderful talk on uh, thank you visual also. Is, is there any question? Uh, professor, how often you do arthroscopic release for uh, 
Uh, Professor Mehmet, can you hear me? Mehmet, can you hear me? How often you do arthroscopic you release? Unmute, for yes, I, I did unmute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do like uh, 10 cases a year, let me say, 10 or 15 cases mm -hmm. a year. And like one third is like five or six uh, arthroscopic. The other other 10 is like open. One okay. third is my arthroscopic. Okay. And how often so, you use the PRP? Uh, PRP is like, it's also like 20, 25%. So yeah. I, oh. as I told you before, my first choice is dry At needling. Least. Ah. Yeah. My first choice is dry needling. The second choice is steroids. Okay. Then PRP. But if the patient was injected somewhere else, then I first PRP, whatever the first injection, the other one, then PRP. Okay. Any two PRP. Okay. Hmm? Yeah. Anybody small, has a small. Yes. Yeah, yes. A small yes. comment. Uh, yes, Prashant, you want to have a yeah. small comment? Uh, yes, uh, the uh, tennis elbow is the one uh, case where uh, let patient ask for the surgery. You don't advise. Okay, this is the only case where you don't advise it. Let the patient ask for the surgery because you have to try other non-surgical method uh, by all means. Means whatever physiotherapy, dry needling, steroid, PRP, whatever you want to do, you do. And then if everything is fail and then patient come and ask him I'm, I'm, I'm want something else, you can make a call to go ahead with the surgery. And another thing uh, about the PRP, like uh, have uh, uh, what we are doing at our place is uh, UAG guided because one of the article uh, uh, from Netherlands, the professor Dennis Agendel, uh, she had shown that all uh, the blind procedure, like whatever we give PRP or steroid, 60% of the time they goes out of the lesion. That does not okay. reach the CRP or the pathology. So the effectivity so of PRP is high, high with UAG guided, you mean to say? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, the steroid is also high uh, with the uh, UAG guided comparing the blind procedure. But if you compare UAG guided PRP plus UAG guided steroid, uh, the immediate effect of UAG guided steroid is very fast attack. But as the graph goes up of uh, healing, it goes down as well as. But the comparing the UAG guided PRP, it starts slow, steady, and it keeps on healing if you uh, hit the uh, uh, target lesion. Ujwal, you have to buy a sonography machine now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yes. So uh, let me let me thank everyone. Whatever is common and always controversial, I think Pratap okay. and Atik will agree with me. Uh, Rajkumar, you, you agree with my statement. Whatever is common, whatever is common is always controversial. And tennis elbow, yes. since our study days, MBBS days, MS days, is always been controversial. Whether whether it is Mr. Sachin Tendulkar or any other person, the treatment has been always controversial. And whatever is common is going to be controversial in orthopedics. And we, orthopedician being a big researcher, will always keep on doing a lot of research, whether it may be in the field of orthobiologics, PRP, surgery, and whatever it is. So I think the science will grow on. Every 10 years, we are going to come up with the new evidences. I'm, wish, I'm very sure Ujwal has started his work around 10 years back. Another 10 years later, he will have a fantastic presentation on this publication. Prashant will come up with a new technique of arthroscopic release. But one thing is going to be remained. That is the foundation of the tennis elbow. And I, I must congratulate Professor Mehmet Demetras exactly. for a wonderful lecture I have ever heard on tennis elbow. It was a mind blowing. It was eye opener. Yes. Every detail, including the differential exactly. diagnosis, the radial tunnel syndrome. Frankly speaking, frankly speaking, I was not aware of so much of differential diagnosis for tennis elbow. I always thought that tennis elbow is one brother. They don't have any other brothers. So, <laughs> so uh, I have I have uh, wonderful uh, words to say. It in fact. Uh, whatever common is always controversial and we are there to solve all the controversies the researchers like dr mohammed nemitas is going to help us to have more and more openings onto the uh, tennis elbow thank you very much sir for your time your valuable time you spoke almost one and a half hours impromptu we all congratulate you for your uh, one, wonderful lecture okay thank you Say hi thank to you. Arun. My friend Arun. Thank Muka. you. Okay. So I will just take it offline.